Over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about biblical authority. You see, this is what we believe. We believe in the scriptures, but we need to understand the extent that we believe in it. You see, why is the Bible foundational for what we believe? One thing that we have as Baptists, Southern Baptists, we have what we call the Baptist Faith and Message. A number of you have this little pamphlet. It's, it's an outline of what we believe. And it's an interesting little pamphlet to read. And as we go through the different articles in it, in fact, we, we did it last week in the new members class. We, we briefly went through it. But uh, it, it talks about what we believe as Baptists. And what's interesting is that the Baptist faith and message does not start with what we believe to be true about God, what we believe to be true about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't start with what we believe about salvation and what we believe about heaven and hell. It starts off with what we believe to be true about Scripture. What we believe to be true about the Holy Bible. And this is significant because everything we believe, everything we believe is based upon this book. It's not based upon an individual revelation. It's not based upon a hierarchy of people. It's not based upon tradition. It's based upon the Holy Scriptures itself. Now, I want, I want to read from you just that very first article that's in there about the Scriptures. And Article 1 from the Baptist Faith and Message. It says, it says, The Holy Bible was written by men divinely inspired and is God's revelation of himself to man. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mix, mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us and therefore it therefore is and will remain to the end of the world the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All scripture is a testimony to Christ who is himself the focus of divine revelation. What we hold in our hands does not merely contain the words of God. Every word of it is the word of God. Is the word of God. Written by men, divinely inspired, and directed by God. And let me make this perfectly clear. We do not worship the Bible. We worship the author of the Bible. And our salvation, we worship the author of the Bible, and our salvation comes through Jesus Christ, who is the focus of the Bible. And as such, we regard Scripture as our final and ultimate base of authority and truth. Anything less than this, anything apart from this, is deficient and opens the door to every conceivable kind of theological distortion. There are people out there that will say anything, but it's got to come from the Word of God. Everything that we hear must be judged by the Word of God. Everything that I preach, I hope you go home and you look it up and you make sure. What does it say about the Bereans over in Acts 17? It said, uh, it said they were more noble than the others, for they searched the Scriptures daily to see whether or not all these things were so. Talking about the preaching of Paul. Over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring biblical authority and the sufficiency of Scripture and what it means to us. And today, we're looking at the practical reasons of why biblical authority. Why biblical authority? Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles 
Turn with me in, in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 17. And in these last few verses, you'll recognize it's ones that we talk about when we talk about Scripture. But I want to put it all in the context. 2 Timothy chapter 3, looking at verses 10 through 17, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Verse 10. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, affliction, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you, as we come to you reading your word, Lord, may your Holy Spirit uh, surround us today and open up our minds and our understanding and our hearts to absorb your word today, your word that was inspired for men to write so many years ago, that, Lord, every word that you have given us is for our benefit and will point us to Jesus. Lord, move among us today and may Jesus be glorified in this place. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Why biblical authority? The world does ask that. You know, what's so special about this Bible? And it does ask the question. You see, the world says we are a people capable of reason and making sound judgment. We do not need God. We do not need His Word. We do not need some holy book to define morality for us. You see, according to the worldview of the postmodernists, you see, that's the day that we live in. It's in the day where there is no such thing as absolute truth. This is the day that we live in. And since there is no absolute truth, then there must be a complete tolerance of all religious truth claims. And such a pluralistic, that means many different religions, is such a pluralistic framework, the only sin that still exists in today's world is the sin of <clears throat> intolerance. The sin of intolerance. You see, it's important for us Christians, it's important for the evangelicals, those that go out with the Word of God. It is important for us to remember that the early Christians, in fact, as we look in early church history, the early Christians were not martyred simply for worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, in the Holy Roman Empire, in that Roman Empire, not the Holy Roman, but in that day, in the first church, those first couple of centuries, in that Roman Empire, they prided themselves on the acceptance of all religions. Then why were the Christians persecuted? You see, the early church was perceived as dangerous because it held that Jesus alone is Lord. In the pure, pluralistic Rome, where anything goes, such a belief is considered to be extreme, narrow-minded, and bigoted. Sounds a little bit like the world that we live in today, doesn't it? As Christians, we are 
extreme, narrow-minded, and bigoted. In a word, the early Christians were being persecuted for being guilty of the sin of intolerance, of intolerance. You see, what does man, but does man make morally good laws apart from God? You know, we think we can live, we got reason, we can, we can make our laws and we can be, survive, uh, and, and we can prosper on the laws and on our conduct today. This is what the world says. But what happens, what happens when man assumes he is the highest authority? We're the, uh, the buck stops here kind of things. We are the authority. You see, if we don't have any moral absolutes, then we cannot establish something is wrong. Some say we establish it by common consensus. But suppose the consensus change, the consensus of the population change, as it was apparent back 75 plus years ago in Nazi Germany, when it was considered proper to perpetuate tra tragic massacres of the Holocaust. All this resulted from the lack of moral absolutes. You see, at the end of World War II, uh, from November 1945 to October 1946, there was known what was, what was called the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial. It was called Nuremberg because it took place in Nuremberg. It was considered the greatest trial in history. And this is where the Allied forces convene a military tribunal to persecute the military and political re leadership of Nazi Germany for various war crimes. What is real interesting, and I challenge you, you can look it up on Wikipedia, but uh, uh, to look at the defense of those that were being tried. And you see their defense was quite simple. They were only following lawful orders. They were following the laws of a nation. In other words, what law did they break? In Nazi Germany, they didn't break any laws. So what are you trying us for? And you see, that was a real dilemma for the prosecution. They did not break any laws, most of them at any rate. Here, as we've had in recent history, we, have, we had a whole nation who, whose laws allowed for mass atrocities. But look around the world today. This isn't anything new. It's happening all over the world today and ever since World War II and before for that matter. And oftentimes these atrocities happen in the name of a religion. You see, who sets the standards? Who determines right from wrong. You see, if we look at what we've been taught, especially in the last 75 years and in the schools, you see, if we're just a cosmic accident, we've evolved out of some primordial slime pit somewhere, who are you to tell me what is right, what is wrong, what is moral, and what is just? You see, this is why the Bible, the Holy Scriptures are needed more today than ever before. You see, at the end of time, God will judge us all in accordance in his written word. Now, let's look at our focal passage today, but to, to put it into context, and, and it's important for us to understand why Paul is writing to young Timothy here. Why he's writing to him. And, and Timothy it was the pastor of the church in Ephesus at the time. Paul was in prison. In fact, in 2 Timothy, that was the last thing Paul wrote as far as we know. But he's writing to Timothy and he's given his last instructions. And sometime after he wrote this, Paul was put to death at the hands of the Romans. You see, to understand and to properly grasp the significance of what's being said, I want us to look, if you've got your Bibles open, we're going to look at the first part of chapter 3. 
first part of chapter 3. We've, we've seen these words before, but let me review them real quick. Uh, well, let's just simply look at the first six verses. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 6. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haunty, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. You know, it doesn't take a, a doctorate in theology to get the big picture of what's being said here. And in fact, all you have to do is open up your morning newspaper, watch the evening news, scope it out on, on Google, look at what's happening in the world today, and aloha, we are there. But let's look at verse 10. And so Paul is shifting gears here. Verse 10 says, but you, but you, Timothy, but you, you're different. We, you are not the like the rest of the world. You were called out of that mess. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. You see, Paul lists these nine, nine things, describing his convictions, describing his afflictions, describing his manner of life, and Timothy had been with them through a lot of these things. In fact, he mentions those three towns. It's interesting. Uh, Antioch, and this is, uh, he mentions Antioch of Presidia, not Antioch of, uh, that's just north of Israel, but that Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. You see, those three towns were young Timothy's old stomping grounds. This is where he grew up. He knew that area, and that's where Paul recruited them from those areas. In fact, you can go read about them over in Acts 13 and 14. Go back and look it up. But Timothy knows that area well. He knows all the events that Paul went through in these three towns. So Paul is just bringing back to his memory you knew what has happened to me. You know, Paul was stoned and left for dead. You know, there were so many things that happened to him. And, and Paul said, and out of them all, the Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered Paul from all of those trials. You see, one thing about living the Christian life, living the life that the scriptures call for us, living a godly life, and that's in accordance with the scriptures, not in accordance with the world. You see, the Bible does not promise us health, wealth, and prosperity by following the Lord. In fact, if we read through and we understand what Jesus had to say, Jesus says, pick up your cross daily and follow me. Understand what the cross meant in that day. The cross was, a, was not a pretty ornament that we wear in a necklace or, or as jewelry. It was an instrument of torture and death. It was an execution device. And Jesus says, pick up your cross daily and follow him. But you know, one thing Jesus did promise, the promise that we have in the Bible, and I've talked with you about this many times, one of the favorite lines, a little line in the Bible that I cherish the most, is that last line in the book of Matthew where Jesus says, For lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What a promise. You see, he doesn't promise us a rose garden, but he does promise to see us through every trial that we have. Going on to verse 13, uh, excuse me, going on to verse 12, and Paul writes, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You see, persecution is what we are told to expect. If you are living your life in a godly way, and in a godly way as defined by the scriptures, not by the world, in a godly way as defined by the scriptures, you can expect trouble. 
What did Jesus say over in John 16? He says, in this life, you will have tribulation. You will have trouble. But he says, rejoice, for I have overcome the world. But we are told that we can expect trouble. And you know, in this country, we're not receiving near the trouble that most Christians are receiving around the world. But you know, if you're not receiving any sort of backlash for godly living, you need to do examine your life. If you're not receiving any backlash for standing up for the Lord Jesus, for living in accordance with the way the scriptures tell you to live, maybe you need to re-examine the way you're living. Living by this book is going to bring you trouble. The scriptures have said so. And the reason for persecution is simple. You see, a godly life, a godly life exposes the evil and wickedness in others. It doesn't mean we go around and point it out to them. But if we're living the life, a spirit-filled life, in the way that the Bible tells us that we need to be living, it will become evident the evil and wickedness in others. And you know, people don't like dealing with their own sin. It's easier to persecute those that are living right than to deal with your own sin. Here in the USA, though, we're only beginning. We are only beginning to see the persecution that true Christians, true Christians in many of the parts of the world have been experiencing for 2,000 years. But there is a promise with persecution. Over in Revelation 2, verse 10, Jesus says, Be faithful unto death. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. But here's the problem in today's world. Here's the problem. Verse 13. Paul writes, he says, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is the world that we live in. It's getting worse and worse. And get an amen on that? It's, it's getting worse. Evil men and impostors are deceiving the world and they're being deceived themselves. You see, it's a cycle. Can you see that? It's a cycle that's impossible to break free without Jesus. What did Jesus say? You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You see, people have got to begin to wonder, what is truth? People don't know what's true anymore. You know, we've been lied about every, on every subject imaginable. We have been lied to. What is the truth? What is the truth? Our only hope is to turn to the Word of God. The Word of God has the truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. He didn't say, I am a truth. He didn't say, I am a life. He says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. The Word of God plainly tells us what the truth is. And yes, there is absolute truth in the universe. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. And he says, but you must continue. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which, was, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. I think it was Mother's Day. It just came to my mind. Mother's Day, uh, you know, I preached about Timothy's mother and grandmother. And this was a verse, you know, uh, that I used because he knew who they learned from. He learned from his parents, his mother specifically. His father was Greek. We don't know much about his father, but we knew his mother was a loyal follower of Jesus and his grandmother as well. He says, you know which you have learned them and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Since childhood. You know, I don't know how many parents I've had come up and tell me, you know, it's great that I bring my kids to Sunday school. I've outgrown Sunday school. You know, I've got news for you. We never outgrow the need for Sunday school and Bible study. 
we never outgrow it. I, I, I've, I've encountered people who say, well, I've read the Bible and I know all there is. <laughs> you do? I'm still learning. I don't know about you. I am still learning every day. There is stuff that, 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 that the Holy Spirit reveals to me every time I read the Word. And so the thing is, we need to study the Word, and then you know what? We need to go back and study it some more. Study it some more. And it says here, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, studying the Bible will not save you. But I tell you what it will do. It will direct you to Jesus. You see, it is Jesus and Jesus alone that saves. And this is where the Bible comes in. Uh, Jesus said, in fact, uh, he was saying the same thing to a bunch of Pharisees and scribes. He said in John 5, 39, he says, You search the Scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testifies of me. John 5, 39. There is no other book. There is no other book that will bring you to Jesus like the Bible. And this includes books about the Bible. There, there's no substitute for reading God's Word directly. No substitute. We need to be busy. Remember the video? We need to be busy hiding God's Word in our heart. It'd be interesting if we were to take all our Bibles and put them away. How much of God's Word have you hidden in your heart? How much? How much? Was it the lady in the video? Uh, memorized many, many chapters, if not books, on scraps of paper. Mm. In prison. Yes, sir. In prison. You know, thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You know, that's a, uh, that's a Bible drill verse we had learned a long time ago. Psalms 119.11. So what the scriptures tells us? What does the Bible tell us? Well, number one, the Bible tells us about our need for salvation. It tells us about our need for sal salvation. It tells us about God's standard and how we have missed the mark, you see, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible informs us that there is a penalty for offenses against the holy God. And those, uh, and those penalties is death and eternal punishment. I preached on hell a few weeks ago. Don't want to go there. But there is a penalty for offending a holy God. And it started back in the Garden of Eden. For the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. Number two, the Bible points out that we cannot save ourselves, our inability. It tells us our inability to save ourselves. You see, the Bible is very clear. There is nothing we can do to earn God's favor. There's nothing that we can do to cover up our sins. The only thing that we can do for our sins is to die for them. But, number three, the Bible tells us it tells us it reveals God's plan for our salvation. We can't save ourselves, but God can. You, it talks about how the blood of Jesus covers our sins, how it made atonement for us before a holy God. And how does the rest of that verse in uh, Romans 6.23 go? He says, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And number four, it tells us about God's assurance for our salvation. How being in the hands of God, uh, go back and read John 10 again. It talks about, Jesus talks about all those that the Father has placed in his hand, no man can take out. That if we are in the hand of Jesus, no one, including ourselves, can take us out of his hand. The Bible gives us assurances of our salvation. In fact, over in 1 John chapter 5, he says, these things I've written so that you may know 
that you have eternal life. Number five, the Bible speaks of our spiritual food to nourish us to spiritual maturity. How is it that God expects us to live? The Bible tells us that. You know, it tells us that we are to know Him and how to know Him more and more and how to serve Him. The Bible tells us what is right, what is moral, and what is just. And you may be surprised as you read the Bible, it doesn't, it doesn't match very well with what the world tells us, what is right and what is moral and what is just. And you know what? God didn't ask me when he set these standards. God set the standards we are expected to live by them. Number six, it is the, the Bible tells us of our sword. Remember over in Ephesians 6, it, it, it talks about the armor of God. There was one offensive weapon in all of that. It says the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. It tells us of our, our sword to fight the evil one and overcoming temptations. You see, we do not live this life defenseless. The Word tells us how to live. Not only what we ought to be doing, but how to do it. And much, much more. This is not a complete list. But these are things that we're all interested in. And these are things that come from the Word of God. It doesn't come from the world. It doesn't come from any one man. It comes from the Word of God. Later, we're going to deal with the sufficiency of Scripture. Sufficiency of Scripture means the ability of the Word of God to address every area of human existence. We get the principles and we can pull from the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17, we're going to examine this a lot more next week. But it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Understand that term, inspiration of God. Translated directly, it means God breathed. God breathed. God breathed the Word. They, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every word in, this, in these Scriptures is without error. It's without contradictions. A lot of people were quick to point out contradictions. What's lacking is, is not the scriptures. It's our understanding. I, I'm sorry. I don't, I'm, I've been working at this book for many, many, many years, and I still don't have my arm around it. I've got a long way to go. It is important that we pick up the word and read it. And for the Bible to speak, we must be in possession of the Holy Spirit. Possession of the Holy Spirit, which gives interpretation. 2 Peter uh, 1, verses 20 to 21. And he says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. It's not what I think that matters. It's what the Holy Spirit reveals to me. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Spirit. We do not get to determine, and I'll talk more about this next week, but we don't get to determine what the Scriptures say. The Holy Spirit moved men to write, and that same Holy Spirit will move to give us understanding. And, then, and as we are given understanding, diligent study and absorption of the Word will see to it, going back to verse 17, that the man of God, man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Word of God is sufficient. The Word of God is our guide to live by every day. It is the sword of the Spirit. Next week, we're going to continue with part two to this, uh, to this message today. But the question I want is, what will you do with the knowledge of the Holy Scripture, knowing it is the very Word of God? Will you allow your Bible to collect dust and never be open? You see, the Word of God only accomplishes its work when it is read and ingested. Keeping it closed, carrying it around with me is not enough. You've got to open it. You've got to read it. And perhaps 
you're here today and you say, yeah, I've read the Bible. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, I, I remember hearing a story from a man who said, you know, I've read the Bible over and over, and I thought I knew everything that it said, but uh, one day I accepted Jesus. And the Holy Spirit came and took up residence in me, and I opened that same Bible in again and said, who changed all the words? <laughs> it makes sense now. <laughs> Only by the Spirit can we understand it. The Bible points us to Jesus. And perhaps you don't understand the Bible today because you're not in possession with the Holy Spirit. You have never met Jesus. What will you do with God's Word? Will you allow it? To lead us to Jesus. You see, that is our problem today. We, we have taken our eyes off of Jesus. We've taken our eyes off of his word. We, we listen to what the world has to say and not what God's word has to say. It is God's revelation of himself to man, and we have it here in our hands. We understand things that the Prophets and the apostles didn't understand because we've got the complete word of God in our hands that they never had. We have got it. And we, what did it say in the video? we got an average of two per home. You know, I, I know I've got three or four just lying around in my office. Do we read the word of God? Do we read it? And then do we allow it to make a difference in our lives? You see, this is sheer dynamite. There's been no book in history that has ever compared with this. And it's our authority for living. It is our authority for worshiping the Almighty God. And it's the one thing that will point us to Jesus. And it's Jesus that will save us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for giving us the direction to Jesus. Lord, you have given us the road map. You have given us the directions for life and that will prosper us. But prosper us for the kingdom. Lord, may we look full in the face of Jesus whom the, your word directs us. And Lord, if there is anyone here today that does not know you, Lord, that through your word that they'll come to a saving knowledge of Jesus and know him personally and experience life eternal and experience a change of heart and experience a changed life. Lord, there are those of us who, who we claim to have known you for years and years, but we've drifted away from it. And, and Lord, we allow too much of the world to enter us. And Lord, we just pray and we, we ask for forgiveness for where we have turned to the world instead of your word. And Lord, we ask that you allow your word to speak to us anew. And that we will come to the standards that you have set for us. For Lord, you, 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 you have given us your word for our benefit. So that we may know you. Lord, we're asking for you to move in our midst today. That your spirit touch every one of us that is here. And Lord, I ask that you move, that you touch. And Lord, as we come to this time of invitation, Lord, we're asking that Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.